Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tetra Research Seminar. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce today my colleague, uh, Ashru. He is a doctoral candidate at Keo Leuven in the Faculty of Theology and Religious Studies, working on a thesis that explores the theme of perfection in the homies of origin, from which we'll be hearing a bit uh, today. Before coming to Leuven for a research master's first, Ashu studied sociology at the University of Mumbai and divinity at the Serampur University in Kolkata. If you want to read his work, earlier this year, Ashu published an article in Vain Studies on deification in origins, homines and numbers, and Plotinus and Ads, where he's suggesting a possible common source um, on deification. And with that, we're very glad to have you here today. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Dan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen right now. Does it work? Yeah. Anyone who constructs a Christian philosophy will need to argue the truth of his doctrines with proofs of all kinds, taken both from divine scriptures as well as from rational arguments. This statement from Contra Selsim mirrors Origen's approach when instructing his congregation on the topic of perfection. He carefully examines scripture to find relevant proofs, and he persuasively argues that the goal for humanity is to achieve perfection. When he discusses his thoughts on perfection, Origen does so by working within a framework of scriptural texts that are interrelated. And on the following slides, I have indicated some of the scriptural texts that are frequently used by him to talk about perfection. In today's presentation, I will share my evaluation of two of these scriptural texts and analyze how Origen incorporates these into his discussions on the topic of perfection. I will also examine whether these scriptural texts receive a consistent interpretation and usage throughout his works, especially his homilies. But before I delve into this topic further, I want to briefly uh, summarize Origen's understanding of the soul's journey towards perfection. As he understood it, the soul as a result of its fall, had lost its primordial purity, and hence it was ordained to cleanse itself and embark on a transformative journey in order to reclaim this original condition of purity. His description of the soul's journey can be condensed into three main phases, purification, illumination, and perfection. The initial phase of the soul's journey towards perfection involves purifying from sins. However, this is merely the starting point. The process of spiritual advancement requires knowledge about divine virtues. But perfection cannot be achieved merely on the basis of this knowledge. One has to act on the basis of knowledge. So knowledge and action based on the knowledge of these virtues are what allow the soul to reach perfection in his understanding. Ultimately, by participating in the Father's perfection, the soul reaches its own state of perfection and is deified. And in this final stage, in his opinion, God becomes the essence and measure of every movement of the soul. God becomes everything to the soul. Origins use of Matthew 5, 8 and Galatians 2, 20. Matthew 5, 8 figures in 39 passages throughout Origins' extant works, of which 22 references are found in the homilies. Similarly, Galatians 2, 20, the first part of this verse is found in 22 places, 28 places in all his works, of which only nine of them are found in the homilies. The stage of purification. In two instances in the homilies on Isaiah, Origen introduces Matthew 5 8, and in both places he is interpreting Isaiah 6 10, which says, For this people's heart has grown fat. In Origen's opinion, the blessed ones are the ones who have a clean heart. According to him, when evil thoughts such as murders, adulteries, etc., proceed from the soul, namely when the soul engages in sin and it is burdened with worldly matters, the heart is fat and unclean. 
He warns the congregation that in such a state, the soul will be unable to receive the words of God, nor see the mystery of salvation. And having said this, he invites his audience to get rid of their sins so that they can appear clean and appear before the Lord in his holy place. He tells them, whoever had a clean heart on account of thinness of this kind, they are the ones that will see God, for God is seen with such eyes. Thus, in his opinion, to become pure in heart, one must get rid of the fatness of the heart. Namely, one should leave behind the preoccupation with the world and be purified from their sinfulness. Only a purified soul can receive divine wisdom, see the mystery of salvation, appear in the holy place, and eventually receive this blessed vision of God. When one looks at his use of Galatians 2.20 in the passages discussing purification, origins, concern, and interpretation are very similar. In the seventh homily on Numbers, he notes that Ecclesiastes 4.2 says, I commend the dead who, are already, who have already died more than the living who are still alive. He argues that a literal reading of this text does not make any sense. Why would someone praise the dead over those who are still living? So instead, he offers to this audience another interpretation. He says, in this instance, scripture is making a comparison between those who are dead to sin and those who are still living for the world. The ones who have died to the world, who have died to, the, who died to sins, they deserve praises because they have acted with goodwill and intention. And he tells his audience, and I quote, if you have renounced the world, if you have rejected vices, if you are no longer provoked to sin, but you are dead to sin, then you are better than the ones who lives to sin. And that praiseworthy death will be in you. In this passage, Origen uses Galatians 2.20 to interpret Ecclesiastes 4.2. And as he does so, the journey of the soul takes center stage. In his opinion, those who are dead deserve praises not only because they have purified themselves from sin, but also because they have embraced a transformed life wherein every aspect of their life is now governed by Christ who lives in them. To draw a parallel, we can examine Origen's use of Matthew 5 8 in chapter 33 of Book 7 of Contra Celsum. On this occasion, he is addressing Celsus's claim that the Christian faith in the resurrection is connected to the idea that it is possible to know and see God. And in his response, Origen says, and that which sees God is a pure heart from which evil thoughts no longer proceed, nor murders, nor adulteries, nor fornications, nor thefts, nor false witnessings, nor blasphemies, nor an evil eye, nor any other evil deed. And that is why it is said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In this instance, Origen defines a pure heart as one that has completely detached itself from wicked thoughts, words, and actions. A person possessing such purity is the one who will have the capacity to perceive God. It is worth noting that while in the homilies, the passages from Matthew 5, 8 and Galatians 2, 20 are incorporated within the framework of scriptural exegesis. In this context, in the Contra Celsum, Matthew 5, 8 is employed as part of a polemic against his adversary. And despite this, Origen does not substantially alter or modify his understanding and use of Matthew 5, 8, nor does he adapt the various elements that he uses to describe the stage of purification to a large extent. In all these passages that we've just discussed, Matthew 5, 8 and Galatians 2, 20, both of these become vital texts in Origen's discussions concerning the stage of purification. Jesus' exhortation to maintain a pure heart and Paul's proclamation to, of Christ dwelling within him, both of these function as exegetical tools in order to interpret the Old Testament narratives in relation to the soul's journey. The stage of illumination. Origen's ninth homily on Exodus is devoted to a discussion on the topic of tabernacles. On the basis of Exodus 25.8, where God says to Moses that the people should make a sanctuary for him so that he will be seen by them, Origen argues that everyone is ordered to fully participate in building a tabernacle so that they can see God. And the rest of the homily is spent allegorizing all the different objects that adorn the tabernacle in relation to the human soul. But what is crucial is his interpretation of the different colors, such as scarlet, blue, purple, etc., that are found in the de decorations of the tabernacle. For him, all these colors represent the different virtues. And following this, he concludes, towards the conclusion of his homily, he tells his audience, 
For it was not said in vain that the fathers dwelt in tabernacles. I understand that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dwelt in tabernacles as follows. In his opinion, Abraham, his embodiment of love was so profound that Abraham was metaphorically robed in purple and people recognized him as a man of God. His willingness to sacrifice his only son as an offering for God exemplified his mastery of the virtue of suffering, which was signified by him being robed in scarlet. And moreover, Abraham's unwavering trust and hopeful anticipation in the fulfillment of God's promises, these were represented by him being clothed in blue, which symbolizes the virtue of hope. Probably due to time constraints, he does not elaborate all the other virtues that Abraham had acquired. And instead, he simply says that Abraham also had all the other virtues. Thus, for origin, the exemplary display and mastery of virtues by Abraham validate that he had a pure heart. This is what enabled Abraham to construct a tabernacle for God. This is what allowed him to see and experience this vision of God. Briefly put, an individual must exercise their free will and diligently pursue virtues such as peace, holiness, etc. And by doing so, they will gradually attain a pure heart, which will grant them this privilege of seeing God. In the beginning of the second homily on Judges, origin deals with the death of Joshua. He reminds his audience that he has already informed them that when scripture talks about Joshua, it actually is talking about Jesus. And having said this, he proceeds to interpret what it means when scripture says that Jesus has died. And in his opinion, there are two kinds of people. First, those in whom Jesus lives. And second, those in whom Jesus is dead. The first category of people consists of those in whom Christ is present and alive, like Peter and Paul. These are the ones who can openly proclaim, I live, but no longer I, but Christ lives in me. Not only does their whole existence revolve around Christ, but they also consider death as a gain. The second category of his people, of people, in his opinion, consists of those in whom Jesus is figuratively dead. These are people who repent of their sins and later commit those sins time and again. Origins use of metaphorical language to depict these sinners as those who crucify and mock Christ is a very powerful way to teach his audience that as long as they engage in sins, Christ does not live in him, live in them. They are also crucifying and mocking Christ. Christ, in his opinion, will be dead in them because they lack virtues which characterize Christ. On the other hand, those in whom Christ lives are people who are still engaging in virtues. The virtues that they practice are attributed to Christ because Christ is the one who is living and working in them. And thus, by contrasting these two categories of people, Origen encourages his audience to choose the better life, a life of virtues, so that they too can say Christ lives in them. Once again, for the sake of comparison, let's examine a passage from the eighth book of Contra Celsa. In this instance, Origen encounters Celsus's assertion that the avoidance of altars, images, and temples by Christians is a sure token of an obscure and secret society. He argues that Celsus fails to understand that the pure mind of a righteous Christian is an altar from which prayers are always offered to God like a fragrant incense. Furthermore, people who cultivate virtues such as prudence, righteousness, etc., they bear divine images within themselves. In his opinion, these images are produced and shaped within the human person by Christ who lives in them and in whom these virtues exist. So rather than physical images or altars, according to Origen, the true manifestations of devotion are found in Christians who practice different virtues that are found in Christ. And he says, and I quote, in each of those who do all in their power to imitate him in this respect, there is an image after the image of the creator, which they make by looking to God with a pure heart, having become imitators of God. Thus, an individual who makes an intentional effort to imitate God does so by imitating the virtues that are found in Christ. And in doing so, they reflect his likeness. However, to realize this imitation, one must look to God with a pure heart. It is purity of heart that gives access to the vision of God for which one must cultivate and practice these virtues. And since altars represent places of worship, which symbolize the presence of God, 
the human person who engages in the practice of virtues will not only receive the vision of god but will also experience the presence of the divine within in the passage from the ninth homily on exodus which we saw earlier origen speaks about tabernacles and uses matthew 5:8 to emphasize the profound significance of constructing a tabernacle through the cultivation of virtues so that one can see god and remarkably in the passage from contra celsum that we have just seen the idea is very similar in this instance one is instructed to create an altar within oneself create an image within oneself you cultivating virtues so that once again one can see god all of these passages demonstrate origen's unwavering fidelity to his understanding and use of scriptural texts such as matthew 5:8 he remains steadfast does not alter his uh, Uh, his understanding of these texts in order to conform them to some kind of conventional constraint of a specific literary style for origen the purity of heart serves a twofold purpose first it serves as a starting point for the soul's journey and second it enables the soul to receive various levels of illumination simultaneously the presence of christ dwelling within also serves to uh, two things first it signifies that the soul has willingly relinquished its own desires and is wholeheartedly embracing the divine will of god and secondly it attests that the soul's inclinations and actions which are oriented towards the pursuit of virtues are all guided and inspired by christ who lives within the stage of perfection in the 11th chapter of the second book of one of his earlier writings the principes origen delves into the topic of god's promises and he discusses the prerequisites for dwelling in eternal life he draws a parallel between a father who guides his child and god's revelation of uh, god's gradual revelation of hidden mysteries to the holy ones he states that participating in this wisdom and knowledge eventually they will behold god directly and achieve perfection however the soul's journey does not culminate with the attainment of perfection even in this exalted state the soul must continue in being nourished so that it can sustain its existence in this perfected state as origen understands it contemplation and understanding of god nourish the soul in this stage of perfection furthermore just as the soul requires sustenance to maintain its state of perfection origen regarded purity of heart as an essential condition for the soul to continue existing in perfection this is because the act of beholding god is an ongoing process it never stops thus it necessitates an unwavering purity in the person at all times one beholds god always purely in the second homily on psalm 67 origen claims that in the book of revelation one finds references to holy festivals and angels playing stringed instruments and celebrating in heaven these in his opinion are prophecies regarding the future state of the human person which have to be interpreted in a spiritual way although in the present the human person worships god in a limited way this will change in the future when the individual progresses from partial knowledge to a complete understanding his or her worship will become a perfect worship and he says at this point with the holy angels archangels thrones lordships we shall hymn god and this will be our work in the coming age to sing with hearts to see god with pure hearts thus when the human person has reached the stage of perfection they will participate in a celestial symphony of worship alongside heavenly beings their sacred duty will be to engage in a reverent worship of god they will bask in the divine presence but all the while preserving the purity of their heart there is only one instance where origen uses galatians 2:20 in relation to the stage of perfection he argues in this case that christ dwells not only in the saints but also in the angels however he contends that there is a difference for he christ is more fully and more clearly and if i may so speak more openly in our changes than in other holy men and this is clear from the following point that when the saints reach the height of perfection they are said to be made like or equal to the angels what becomes evident here is that the soul progressively engages in the practice of virtues and hence the presence of christ within it assumes an ever increasing significance it reaches a point where the soul becomes like or equal to an angel in this ultimate state of perfection the soul exists with a fully realized image of christ embedded within itself and thus the perfected individual undergoes a profound metamorphosis it commences with their detachment from the world 
from their detachment from their from sins and vices and it culminates with their entrance into a renewed state of existence a state which is firmly rooted in christ such that it is a fuller and clearer image of christ within origin according to origin the teachings regarding the purity of heart and the indwelling of christ in scripture are not limited to the initial phases of the soul's journey rather they persist even in the stage of perfection in this perfected state the soul is nourished and sustained by its own purity which it has diligently cultivated as well as the abiding presence of christ within the soul's purity and indwelling of christ intertwined to form together an enduring and transformative spiritual reality which is what allows the soul to conduct itself and to perform its duties in the heavenly realm to conclude in this brief presentation i've tried to demonstrate the significance of two scriptural texts matthew 5:8 and galatians 2:20 and origins discussions on the topic of perfection origin perceived these passages as crucial hermeneutical tools that illuminate the journey of the soul it starts from purification advances through illumination and culminates in perfection while cleansing from the sins begins this transformative journey the soul must practice and master virtues while being enlightened by divine wisdom eventually this growth leads the soul to the sight of god and a deeper experience of christ in dwelling as the soul relentlessly continues relentlessly continues to pursue this purity of heart this allows it to advance through the initial stages and progress towards perfection and here it undergoes a profound trans- transformation it sheds its earlier identity which was corrupted by vices and sins and it takes on a new identity an identity that continues to evolve as the soul imitates christ and practices virtues until it is no longer the soul that lives but christ who lives within it so going back to the question that i mentioned in my introduction do these scriptural texts maintain a consistent interpretation and application in origins homilies similar to how they are interpreted or employed in his commentaries and topical treatises i think it's a very difficult question to provide a straightforward answer to however on the basis of this preliminary an- analysis it would appear that the ideas regarding the soul's purification illumination and perfection especially when origen uses these scriptural texts they remain consistent throughout origen's works he does not significantly alter or adapt his ideas concerning the soul's journey nor does he greatly modify the way he uses these scriptural texts across different types of works secondly it is noteworthy that these scriptural texts find greater prominence in origins homilies and commentaries rather than his other works but this is also to be expected since origins homilies and commentaries were specifically crafted to instruct and guide individuals to lead a virtuous christian life with the ultimate aim of perfection thirdly the passages where these scriptural texts are incorporated in his works origin mostly speaks about purification from sins and vices these scriptural texts appear with less of frequency in his discussions on illumination and sometimes are completely excluded when he starts talking about the stage of perfection and lastly when we analyze origin's early writings in comparison to his later works it becomes apparent that his viewpoint on the soul's journey towards perfection as well as his understanding and his use of scriptural texts exhibit a great consistency however i think a more detailed study is required to fully explore this aspect on a lighter note i'm inclined to believe that if we do so we will find that origen over the course of his career he gradually refined and perfected his own understanding of human perfection with that i conclude thank you very much for listening and i look forward to your questions and comments thank you thank you very much for this recent fascinating presentation uh, we open now the floor for questions if you have any questions you can either type in the chat or raise your electronic hand or wave at us i think i should be able to to see you all if you wave um maybe i ah i see valentina has one yeah and then done Valentina, please. Yeah, uh, so Ashu, thanks very much for this interesting presentation of origin uh, um, perspectives. I have a question. Since uh, uh, you analyze Galatians, so basically, does grace or in a way the alterity grace effort play any role in this perspective? Because it looks to me like um, 
perfection is a consequence of the virtues in a way, and uh, thus uh, grace actually. So the acting of God plays a role in it. Thank you. Uh, that's a very important question. Thank you very much, Valentina. I think uh, uh, when he uses these scriptural texts, I think on a few slides, I think uh, he mentions how Christ is the one who imparts and shares his virtues because these virtues are eventually found in him. He is the virtues, uh, uh, as he says in one of his homilies on the Psalms, if I remember. So without divine grace, without God actually giving you these virtues, I don't think uh, the human being can achieve it on his own. Uh, although it is very clear, though it was not explicitly mentioned today uh, in my in my work, I have very explicitly mentioned that divine grace and human participation go hand in hand for origin. Without divine grace, there is no attaining perfection at all. And that is one of the differences between him and Plotinus, for example, because Plotinus hardly talks about the role of divine grace. I yes. hope that answers your question. Uh, specifically with the use of Galatians 2.20, I, I have to uh, think about that. I will keep that in mind. Thank you. No, thanks to you. It answers my question. Thank you very much, Dan, and then Albert. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Ashu, for very interesting stuff. I'm very um, happy to, to hear that. I'm curious about, uh, you speak of the stages of perfection, um, okay. and I'm curious whether for origin, this is, all, this is the ignorance question. I don't know, uh, so, but I'm curious. Are they, these stages um, rigidly theorized and, you know, like in a list, he's always, every time he speaks about uh, perfection, he would be producing the same list of key terms. You need to be that, then that, then the other. Or does he just speak um, metaphorically, intuitively about stages um, with uh, the elements of the stages uh, changing from one word to another? What's your perception, um, perception of that? I'm curious. Thank you. That's uh... Very interesting question as well. Uh, so it is not a rigid system in his works as far as I understand it. I think uh, these three stages, at least in my understanding, have come since I've started reading secondary scholarship and then reading Origins works as well. And I compare, okay, there is there are these three stages which are very evident. But the way he describes these stages are very flexible. So purification, he doesn't necessarily have to say the same things again and again. But the works that I uh, compared for this presentation or those scripture, those passages where these scriptural texts are used, what I found was that his focus when he talks about purification, for example, it's always related to words, thoughts, and actions. Because in one of these places, he also says these are the three things through which the human person can fall to sin. And so when he talks about purification, there will always be some form of discussion on these three elements in different ways, whatever he finds convenient to use at that moment or whatever the scripture uh, is talking about. So for example, the, uh, the one with uh, the fatness of the heart, then the more focus is on that, uh, interpreting what fatness means. So it is the scriptural text which determines what how he describes uh, purification, for example, in that homily. Uh, the same goes for illumination. He talks about knowledge, rece receiving knowledge, but does not necessarily speak about virtues in that same uh, passage. But in other places, he will talk about virtues, which is again referring to uh, a higher form of illumination in his understanding. Uh, and perfection, the discussions on the final state, as I said, uh, as I mentioned in the last slide, are uh, much less uh, in the homilies which I am studying for my dissertation. So uh, I still have to compare in his other works where he talks a lot about perfection uh, to understand, uh, to answer your question fully, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So that's a bit of a mix. Some elements are repeated from here and there, but yes. he reformulates yes. it to suit the context. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think Albert was first and then Sofia. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. I was wondering about the fact that, uh, to my knowledge, 
there is no journey of the soul in the whole Bible. It's a philosophical, and perhaps from Egypt imported, but in scripture, or only in the Apocrypha and uh, Apocalypse of Paul and Peter, there you have that like thoughts, but not in New, New and Old Testament, as far as I know. So I'm wondering how you could, and how Origin also could base on this small uh, uh, base of scripture, his whole theory. Do you uh, understand? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. That is one of the complicated questions. I think the most complicated one till now in this presentation. Uh, I think uh, the answer to this lies in the lies in how Origen understands the human person. His theological anthropology is very philosophical, and that's what makes him uh, interpret scripture in a certain way. So the uh, Genesis uh, 126, the first creation as the creation of rational souls, and then uh, the souls cooling down in their devotion for God and, uh, and taking on denser bodies. And hence, the soul has to go back to a state where it leaves behind its denser body and then go back to becoming a pure rational soul, which is always contemplating God. And this is how he understands the human person himself. And so it's on the basis of this understanding, I think, that he starts interpreting scripture and makes use of scripture to, how do you say, create a kind of scriptural handbook or a handbook of scriptural verses that talk about the soul's journey back to perfection. So it's basically how he understands the human person. Uh, I can't say for 100% that his understanding of the human person is scripturally uh, formed. It might have been philosophically formed, but I think it's basically a blend of both of these two together. So he sees, he has the awareness of philosophical uh, uh, ideas about what the human person is, the soul and the soul's journey to back, return to the one. And then he finds similar things uh, being said in scripture when he figuratively reads it. And so he combines this, these two together. Okay, this is what it means for the Christian uh, person to live in this world. The, the Christian person is the soul in, in, in the center, which is supposed to journey back to God. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Yeah, it seems more Plato than scripture. That I want to say. Uh, yes, it is not only it's a or, or, or I don't know, but uh, yeah, anyway, not thank you. Scripture. Thank you very much. And then wish you good luck with your research. Thank you. Yeah, thank you indeed. Uh, Sophia? Thank you, Asha, for your presentation. That was really interesting. I'm actually curious about the body. So you already mentioned that body is something like negative maybe in origins like entire worldview but I'm, I'm just curious what the role of the body is in the purification process and are there any like possibilities to have the body after resurrection in a sort of in a sort of a positive way or what kind of a body we will have after the resurrection according to origin if you can elaborate uh, on that yeah. I think that will take a whole presentation itself to discuss origins, theological anthropology. It's a very, you know, it took me one month to figure out the answer for myself pretty much, or more than a month actually. I wasted a lot of time on this. But uh, I think uh, uh, one, the body for origin is the medium through which the soul makes progress. And the physical body is... Uh, as uh, Jacobson, one of these or or origin scholars, he puts it, it is the ground where the soul's battles are waged on a daily basis. This is the site which experiences divine punishments. And these punishments are the are punitive, uh, are corrective measures, which are manifested in the body so that the soul can correct itself and continue its journey to God. It's so in my understanding, the body for origin is a co-participant in the soul's journeys. As the soul attains perfection and is eventually united to God, 
the body itself will be transformed to a better condition. Namely, it will, uh, in his words, take a, a spiritual character. Uh, and I don't think, uh, I, I'm not sure if he has a very negative impression of the body because, for example, in one place he says that it is not the body that is evil in itself. So this is a passage from the homily on Leviticus, and I will uh, quote this. It says, uh, it is established that it is the soul which either soars in the flesh or in the spirit and which can go to ruin and sin or be converted from sin. For the body is its result to whatever the soul chooses. So basically the body has no will of its own. It is following the soul. So the body does not inherently have something evil in his opinion. And this is not only in the homily and Leviticus. I think he also mentioned something similar in contrast as in. So uh, the idea that origin has a very negative view of the human body or the physical body, uh, I think that might be a little misplaced. I think we have to balance both these things that he says in other places and the things that he says in other places by taking into uh, account the larger context in which these discussions are involved or in which he makes these statements. Uh, I don't know if it answers your question. Does it? Uh, yeah, partially. <laughs> partially. partially. <laughs> but for a fuller yeah, answer, I think, <laughs> for a fuller answer, I think, as I was telling Dan and the others uh, earlier, I think uh, we'll have to wait for my dissertation or something. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you, Asha. I, 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 by the way, uh, how about the resurrection and the body? The resurrection, as I said, uh, in the resurrection, the body is transformed into a spiritual character. And that's okay. as far as he describes it uh, on the basis of my reading of limited reading, maybe of his works, I guess. But uh, maybe I will find something more. I don't know. Not okay. Sure. At the okay. moment, as far as I can say, it's yeah, it takes on a spiritual character. Oh, uh, right. It is the same. It won't be. It won't be the same. <laughs> no, he says that it will be the same body, okay. but it will take a spiritual character. So the body doesn't change. Like that would be. Uh, I don't know what the Greek philosophical word for that was, where the soul is placed in another body, one body to the other. But there is a word for this, but I don't remember it right now. But he just says that this does not take place, that the soul is not placed into another body. The soul will take its own physical body, but this physical body will be transformed in such a way that it can share in the glory of God. It will be a spiritual uh, body so that it can uh, reside in this spiritual realm. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I have a small question. I mean, you're partially started answering and expanding on that already in one of the replies to the question, but I was wondering if you could say something more about the idea of fatness. Uh, is it just something that um, blocks you in a way, blocks the, the soul, or is there more to that? Because it seems to be somehow important in the whole reconstruction, right? Uh, the fatness, as far as I remember, in both those cases, he just connects them to evil and uh, he doesn't further elaborate what this fatness means. But for him, he just says it is uh, the fatness symbolizes the human person's preoccupation with worldly matters, with sins and with uh, vices. And that's uh, and the, as you get rid of these sins, if, as you leave these worldly concerns behind and you start focusing more on divine things, then you're transforming from a state of fatness to thinness. And that thinness is what allows you to see God. So uh, more, more than that, I don't remember him describing what this fatness of the heart means. Mm. Okay, thank you. That's, no, no, that's that's really very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Saliba, there. I used, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ashu, for this uh, great presentation. I have a small question. Um, I mean, if we read the scripture, uh, we see like, such uh, examples from the Old Testament also, I mean, in the famous uh, Psalm of David 51, says uh, about the purification of the heart and the, um, and the soul and so on. Uh, and when we regard Paul's also is the same situation, uh, are there any personal reflections in original origin text that reflects on a personal matters that to uh, uh, to realize uh, why this person could I mean um, 
what is the realization of the person to come to this stage of the purification? Why, uh, as a human being, need to be purified or illuminated? So any, any uh, personal reflections on this matter in the origins uh, text? I mean, why, like, I mean, we know that uh, the, the acts of David and then uh, Paul was uh, one of the uh, persecutors of uh, Christ uh, followers and so on. So are, are there any, any, any grains of such uh, reflections? That's a very interesting question. Uh, so, if I understand the question well, uh, you want to know if Origin talks about his personal experiences related to this journey of the soul. Uh, uh, very difficult. I, regarding the stage of purification, nothing comes to my mind right now. He often confesses while preaching that he is a humble, he is a sinner, and uh, he asks the audience to pray for him so that he may be cleansed and he can actually start dealing with the word of God. Uh, so that's as far as I remember with uh, regarding him and his personal reflections on uh, purification. So he himself confesses that he needs purification on many in many instances. One explicit reference to um, the stage of illumination, for example, is his commentaries on the Song of Songs. I think it's the commentaries on the Song of Songs where he talks about the bridegroom uh, standing next to him and him having a close encounter with the bridegroom. Uh, but this experience is a fleeting experience. It does not stay. It, uh, the bridegroom leaves away. So he talks about how he himself has achieved a sort of illumination at one point in his life, whether he went back on some account that is not mentioned there, uh, but at, there are personal reflections on the first two stages in these, in these ways, but the third stage of perfection, I have never read anything on him talking about him having achieved perfection in some case. Like, uh, yeah, he brings in Paul's account of going from one of the heavens to the other heavens, and he talks about them, but he doesn't say that he has crossed any of the different uh, levels of heaven or anything of that sort. Yeah, I don't know if this is very helpful, though. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Johan Lehmanns has a question. Thank you. Thank you, Ashu. Um, a question you may get quite more often, but still, when it comes to literary genre, you have the homilies. You also include the other writings of origin I saw. Would you say there is continuity or discontinuity between those two corpora? Is origin making, say, pastoral mitigation in his homilies or not at all? So can you, on the basis of your research of the past year, say something about this? Is the homilist origin a different person than, say, the author of De Principis or not at all? Mm -hmm. Just uh -huh. an open question. Uh, that that is quite uh, that is something that will come up in the dissertation eventually. Uh, on the basis, I think uh, one of the uh, last things that I said in the conclusion, for example, is how these scripture texts are incorporated in his works, how these ideas are in, incorporated in his works. And in the homilies, you find that Origen mostly talks about purification, but does not talk about uh, illumination and perfection on that scale. And I think that this, for example, is because. Yeah. Uh, there is a different class of people to which he's catering these different uh, texts or genres or whatever this is, homilies, commentaries, other writings. So, for example, in the homilies, it's more purification because this is a mixed crowd of people where you have simple-minded folk, some who are a little mature and some who have already kind of uh, really achieved a lot of maturity in their Christian life. And so for this mixed audience, what is best is talk about purification so that everyone gets something uh, that is relevant to them. But in the commentaries, which are for a more advanced group, he will talk more about illumination, for example, and maybe even uh, refer to the stage of perfection, which is also what you find in his other works, such as De Principis, which has a lot of references to this final state of perfection, uh, this uh, this uh, this final uh, day of judgment, for example, or this existence of souls in uh, the heavenly realm. 
So that kind of a difference is definitely noticeable. Otherwise, the basic idea that he has on all of these stages, I think they remain consistent throughout his works. Uh, the scripture that he uses changes because obviously uh, whatever is read in the church is determining what text he is going to interpret and that shapes how he will elaborate on each of these stages. But otherwise, his understanding of this topic of perfection, overall, it stays the same in my understanding. Uh, and also the scripture texts, for example, the ones that I compared today, these are the ones I've already finished comparing to a, a, a almost a, in a fuller sense. And these texts are also used very consistently when he talks about each of these stages. They don't, they, he doesn't make too many modifications or anything. The only modification that can be noticed is if the if the context, for example, if he's countering Celsus or if he's writing in De Principis, if that is different, then there might be slight differences. But otherwise, the ideas, the use of scripture, I think it remains consistent. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, indeed. Uh, Dan? Um, I was curious about uh, one thing, whether he's, um, if you already looked into it, you might not have. I don't think that's the focus of your thesis. So I'm curious about everything that you gathered from reading bibliography on this. How does uh, Origen situate with his conception of uh, perfection and, and of all of this um, among other authors before and after him? How, how does that go? Is his, uh, whatever he does about this theme, something that's a common theme? across this area for a couple of centuries and they deal it in the same manner always or he's a weirdo in a corner having his own conception that no one picked up and everybody did it in a different way how uh, how, how do you see this thank you uh, this is uh, something that i will uh, work on uh, uh, in the next phase i think of my thesis as i start concluding it but I've already, uh, th there is something in my mind to compare how these topics and, for example, Matthew 5 8, which is something that Clement also uses a lot. Uh, and there's even a, a paper on this Clement's use of Matthew 5 8 in order to talk about the purity of heart, etc. And I want to compare these. So I have made a note of this, but at the moment, I can't, uh, I don't have an answer to your question, Dan. Sorry. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Um, thank you. I was just curious if you are already getting there. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Irrespective. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And we're all looking forward to the rest of your research. Thank you. I guess that if there are no further questions, we can thank our speaker again for a fascinating presentation and rich discussion. And uh, see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.